Dry Cities Community TV presents the second in a five-part speaker series, Life Stories, put on by the Kogulam Public Library. So before we get, begin, we're going to do an uh, land acknowledgement. So we acknowledge that Coquitlam Public Library provides service on the unceded traditional territory of the Coquitlam First Nation, which lies within the shared territories of the Suela Tooth, Katsi, Musqueam, Kukite, Squamish, and Stolo Nations. Welcome to our second, second session in our five-part speaker series, Life Stories. We wanted to present real life stories of people from marginalized groups and how they had experienced prejudice, social exclusion, or stigma. By understanding and appreciating everyone's past and present, we can build a better future for all. We want to thank you for, for coming to this, to this session. Please join us for the remaining three parts every Tuesday evening until November 22nd. And for more information about the three next sessions, check out our website. So today we continue our series with the topic LGBTQ2S+. We're excited to introduce Christopher Bolton, AK drag icon, the unstoppable Connie Smudge, mm -hmm. and Gary Fluffer Woods as they discuss their diverse backgrounds and personal life experiences through the two LGBTQ plus lens. We welcome questions at the end of the presentation. Hi, it's going right there. How I went that doing? way. I'm really well. Can you believe that we are not on the North Shore? I know. I even, I even got on the Sky Train tonight. It was spectacular. Really? Hi, everyone. My name is Chris Bolton. And I'm Gary Woods. And, and together, we are from the, the North, North Shore, Shore Pride, Pride Alliance. Alliance. And we cover from Deep Cove to Lions Bay and every alleyway, stairwell, and mm, fabulous experience in between. And um, Gary's going to give you a little talk first about his, his herstory and uh, uh, I'm going to follow with a little bit, and then we're going to tell you what we do in North Van, West Van, and Lions Bay for Pride Acknowledgement and Pride Inclusivity, and uh, then we'll take some questions. Does mm -hmm. that sound good? That sounds fantastic. Okay, I'm going to leave it to you then. Yeah, okay. get out of here. I'll be, I'll be back. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out to this evening. Um, so my name is Gary um, Woods, and um, I basically came to Canada in 1974. Um, I'm originally from Los Angeles, California, um, from a broken home. Um, my mom and dad did not uh, do very well together. And um, so in order to kind of separate their relationship and to, so that she can kind of get off onto her own, she decided to take her um, small inheritance from my grandfather and decided to come back to Canada. And her main reason was, well, first of all, was the education. She said, you're definitely going to go to school in Canada. And so that's where we're going. And then also, too, we had more family and everything that was up in uh, Toronto at the time. Um, with that being said, uh, I guess maybe about 12 or so, um, I was in uh, public school and I just started noticing this boy who decided to come into the classroom and join the class. Uh, he was from uh, Quebec City and his name was Mark and um, he looked really, really beautiful to me <laughs> and I was quite attracted to him um, and I didn't really understand why. Uh, at this particular time I was noticing that my other friends were looking at getting girlfriends and going out on dates and you know to the movies and to have some fun and everybody was kind of wondering where my date was and I said that's a really good question and I started to ask myself where, where is my date? Who is that girl? And it turns out that there wasn't really a girl for me, but yet a boy. Um, from that particular moment on, I ended up meeting uh, my neighbor, 
Um, his name was Ian, and he was uh, in the same grade as what I was, but yet went to a different school. And um, Friday nights kind of became our little date night. So I'd like to thank the Dukes of Hazard for that. <laughs> Tom Wopat and John Schneider, thank you very much. Um, so it was, uh, and that, hap that continued on for about a year or so for a season of Dukes of Hazard. And um, then the, he moved away. Um, when he moved away, I was really, I was really, really saddened. Um, again, not really understanding that my emotions were, were at play here, more than just the signs of attraction of, of who he was. Um, but uh, we ended up, you know, continually being in touch from time to time. Um, but yet, um, our relationship, you know, friendship did actually uh, sever. Um, which kind of left me free and open. So I guess I was on the, you know, I was uh, out there and um, kind of realizing, hey, what's, what's happening? And continuing along that line for, throughout public school and heading right into high school, um, I kind of kept it a secret to myself and to others that I was attracted to boys and uh, not really girls. And my mom was kind of wondering what was happening and why I wasn't really going on dates. and. Um, we didn't really have many conversations. My family wasn't really one to kind of talk to one another. Um, we were more along the lines, well, you know, um, just to let you know, Gary, I was in the hospital last week, and but everything's fine now, sort of family. Um, you know, we don't really tell each other what's going on in our lives. We just kind of react to what's happened to that. Um, and that's really, from that moment, you know, realizing that that was happening within my family, um, I didn't really, I was quiet. I, I kept things to myself. Um, I didn't really have uh, many people to talk to. Um, and which is, which is difficult, you know, um, realizing that I'm different than, you know, my best friend, um, my other friends in, in school, and now I'm heading into a high school and I'm wondering what's going to happen next. I mean, you hear all the stories about, you know, coming into the freshman year of the high school and having your head put on down the toilet and having it flushed and welcome, welcome Gary to school, you know, um, you know kind of a hazing rituals and I uh, thought, oh, wow, now what's going to happen now that I, I'm different, you know. Um, and so heading into high school, uh, you know, 15, 16, 17, I didn't really have... I mean, I had friends, but again, it's not like I discussed with them or what was happening or what was going on um, with my thoughts and feelings for others um, until I decided to take drama. And I'm so glad I took that drama class because in that drama class was a man, was a, a boy um, named Stephen, and he was um, cute and blonde and sexy to me. And I thought, wow, I'm going to sit right beside him, the entire <laughs> class. Um, and I did. And then when I couldn't get a seat beside him, I started to notice that he started to come and sit beside me. And I thought, wow, that's really interesting. And then when I there was a project and a play going on, um, which was about the kidnapping of the Lindbergh baby, and I had this whole German soliloquy that I had to learn to speak, and um, I needed help with that. And I thought, this would be a really good time to maybe ask Steve and to kind of help me out with it. And, but I didn't have to ask him because he came up to me and asked me um, if I needed help. And I said, yes, <laughs> I definitely do. Um, from that moment on, um, Stephen and I got to know each other really well. and. Um, and I've kind of started to discover that I wasn't really the only person in school who was gay. Um, I didn't even know what gay was. I mean, I knew the terminology. I knew, you know, other slang um, that was thrown at me and thrown at uh, my friends that looked different than myself um, that were actually straight. And um, that was what I knew. But I didn't know that there was anybody else out there like me until I met Stephen. Uh, so it was really freeing for me, um, especially since he also had, he's from a, a family of five, and he also had um, a brother named David who was a hairdresser in downtown Toronto. 
And so it was through Stephen that I got to know David and that um, I started learning what gay culture was and how there was a community center in downtown in Toronto, how there was a bookstore that I could go to in downtown in Toronto to learn about what gay culture was, to learn about some of the history, to learn about um, what our, our issues are and what our challenges are. And for me to realize that I wasn't like, A, the only person out there like this, but then to head into a youth drop-in center in downtown Toronto and to meet other people from the other, from, from the other greater Toronto areas, it was amazing. It was so um, enlightening to me. And I'm getting for clam talking about it because it was just, it was a release and a relief to know that I wasn't the only one. Um, so I was able to um, head down there um, once a week, and I looked forward to it. It was, you know, to meet other different people, um, to talk about where they were from and what they had to go through with their families and how quiet we all were and how closeted we all were. But yet when we were together, we were so free and alive. Um, and then all of a sudden, um, somebody started talking about what we, what we should do for pride. And I was like, what are you talking about? What is, what is pride? And, and then they like said, well, let's take you to the Glad Day Bookshop in downtown Toronto, and you're going to find out. I'm like, okay. So we went in, and um, we started talking to some people, and I realized that pride was this huge celebration of rights, but also filled with activism as well. Um, how important it was for us to continue to push the envelope of what those rights are and to make sure that they are being um, put into place and that they are being um, recognized. And I will never forget it. I was heading down the subway um, during Pride Week. This was at the end of June, um, which you know adheres to the Stonewall riots that happened within New York City. Um, we were, it's the end of June and we're heading down there, school's, you know, pretty much out and like we, we're free and we're clear, we got no homework and nothing to do. And, um, and we head down on a Sunday afternoon down to the parade and I just don't see, you know, 25 or 30 people. I see dozens of hundreds of thousands of gays and lesbians and bisexuals and transgenders and queers and, and our allies and our friends. and. Um, we walked down uh, from the subway by, um, by Young and Bloor area, which is one of the main intersections within Toronto. And um, somebody actually recognized us and was like, hey, and they were waving us into the parade. And uh, they waved us into the parade and um, we got, I got to march my very first Pride Parade that year. Um, this is at the age of 17. And uh, from that moment on, I knew that, you know, I am gay and that this is part of who I am and that others aren't necessarily going to like it, and including my family, including some of my friends that lived in suburban Toronto. Um, but I had to be who I had to be. I had to be me. Um, with that being said, then I went back um, after Pride and... Um, also, too, during that Pride, I got to run into Scott Thompson from Kids in the Hall, which was fantastic. Hi, Scott. <laughs> uh, so we were, I was super excited and um, went back and um, we went back uh, to uh, Scarborough, and, uh, which is a, suburb, a suburban area of Toronto. And we uh, went and met up with some of Steve's friends and with my friends, and we came out to them and told them and they said really you're serious and we said yeah and they said no Gary we're being sarcastic like we kind of knew that there was something going on and I'm like well how did you know how would you know? they're like well you know you and Steve really spent a lot of time together <laughs> and I'm like okay um, so that was really kind of nice to hear from my friends that they kind of accepted me um, for who I was and that um, Steve's friend uh, vice the same thing vice versa that they were accepting of him and, and uh, both of us and our relationship as boyfriends um, this is you know in the late 80s uh, 87 and 88 around there um, 
and we continued along the lines of, of coming out. However, not everybody really did all that. Um, my main support of friendship was, was there, yes, like uh, the person that I grew up with and um, was really good friends with uh, down the street. Um, his friends were really supportive. Um, however, the offshoot of uh, friends of friends were really questioning and were really kind of scared and were really not sure what was happening um, and why it is that we were, were this way. Um, we also was during a, a time when AIDS um, was really uh, was a real became a real epidemic, um, and we were really quite scared and coming out um, and being in a relationship and you know it's how do you remain safe and so we went to the 519, which is the community center in downtown Toronto. And we got to learn um, how to be safe and what um, you know condoms did for us and what uh, we can do for each other and how you know uh, monogamy is a good thing and um, and how sustaining uh, from sex uh, sexual activity and getting tested and it was important you know um, getting tested was was difficult uh, we could only do that in downtown Toronto, um, whereas if we went, I went to my doctor and asked about it, and she's like, well, does your mother know? And she started bringing up my mom, and she started bringing up information about how um, I need to be careful, and, and which is, you know, it, it, that's pleasant that she really cared, but it seemed more of like, I'm going to tell on you, and uh, you really have no rights for privacy. And so I kind of stormed out of that doctor's office and then my boyfriend Stephen and I went downtown and got our tests done and it came out free and clear, which was, which was lovely. Uh, so because of all that was happening in the background with the AIDS epidemic um, and uh, people were, and then what was happening in the news and, and in mainstream media and there wasn't really anything happening um, going on. Um, as far as like information that was coming through and um, so everybody seemed to be quite um, n uneducated about it and so it was at that particular time that I was talking with some of my friends and then I started educating them on what I knew and and that really seemed to kick off this lifetime of educating people about about gay culture, about um, our challenges, about things that we have to overcome, um, and which I, I don't necessarily mind uh, because these are individuals that I care about, and and um, and I want to make sure that they're in the know and that they understand uh, what it is that we all go through uh, in our community. But at the same time, it's a really I'm tired sometimes, you know? Sometimes I just don't want to talk about it. Like, it's, you know, it's, I just want to go home and sit on the couch and watch Jeopardy, you know? Um, but other times I get that, I, how brave they are in asking me those questions. And that's when I, I kind of identified that I'm, at heart, a bit of an activist in the fact that, you know, going to Pride and, and, uh, and, being there with my friends, and which is my extended family, and um, learning what I needed to learn and to be able to pass that along to others that don't know. And um, the next big thing was not just my friends, but then my family. I had got, Stephen and I had got into a huge, huge fight. Um, a really big argument and thought it was over and me being young at age and 17 I'm like this is it it's the end of the world and and not really understanding love because I've only had one or you know well I guess I don't know if Ian, me and the Dukes of Hazard Friday nights was really a relationship um, but you know I only really had that kind of experience I didn't really have anything really too emotional to kind of play off of and you know Will and Grace wasn't on TV at the particular time and you know there wasn't really any representation out there that I could look at um, just stuff that I could talk to others at the youth drop-in um, which which helped me get through um, quite a few um, obstacles in life uh, however, getting back to you know this big uh, fight and argument that I had with Stephen and and dropping him off, 
um, and then heading home, um, I was, I came in the door and I was distraught and I was upset and I guess it was maybe around one o'clock in the morning and my mom was like, well, where were you? What are you doing and what's happening? Um, because she didn't know anything, you know? I mean, this is also, she was really in, I think she kind of knew something was happening, um, but she didn't really know, you know, about me being full-blown gay or anything. And um, I decided, you know, she's like, what's the matter with you with that night? And I said, well, I, I said, I've, I've had a, I said, you know Steve? And she's like, yeah. I said, well, he's my boyfriend. And she just stopped and looked at me and, um, I said, he's my boyfriend, and I'm gay. So, and I just waited, and the next thing out of her mouth was, don't worry, this is a phase, and we will get you the best help that you will have, that you will need. So, we'll, we'll look after this together. Don't tell anybody. Nobody needs to know any of this. Just go to bed, and everything will be fine in the morning. Okay. I didn't really know that that meant conversion therapy. I didn't really know that that meant um, to hide who I was. I was just like, okay, my mom's gonna help. This is gonna be good. And I went to bed and when I went to bed, my phone rang because I was like a little teenage girl. I had my own little phone in my bedroom. And uh, thank you, landline. And um, my phone rang and it was Stephen. And he was calling to apologize. And I said, I'm sorry. And we kind of made up. Um, so the next day we decided to meet up together and uh, we talked it out and he came over for dinner and but nobody was home my mom was at her wine club at the, that time and my stepfather um, which is father number two for me um, was out at work um, doing a late night job and my stepbrother wasn't at home either and so it was pretty much just him and I in this five bedroom house um, out in rural um, out in uh, Scarborough Anyway, so um, we decided to hang out, and then we went out for dinner, uh, had some dinner, and then we decided to go out and went and saw a movie with some friends, so that was fun. And we came home, uh, back to my place, and we wanted to spend the night together. And so we did. Um, everybody, by the time we got home, everybody was pretty much in bed, except for my stepfather, who was in the rec room. And beside the rec room, there's the um, empty bedroom. And so I went around the back and I let Steven, <laughs> let Steven in through the back and we went into um, the bedroom and um, we decided to have some fun with one another. And I thought, great, this would be awesome. And then he could sleep here and then I'll just go, I'll just sneak back upstairs into my bedroom. Nobody will be any of the wiser, except I fell asleep. And when I fell asleep, I fell asleep in his arms. And at around four o'clock in the morning, apparently my stepfather, who decided, who was in the next room, in the rec room, decided to get up and go into the, go into the extra bedroom because he thought he would just go to bed there. Well, lo and behold, he was quite shocked when he saw me and Stephen in each other's arms uh, asleep. And um, I didn't know this until the very next day when my mother called me and said, I thought you weren't going to tell anybody. And I thought, what, I, I'm, what, do you, what? Like, what, I didn't say anything to anybody. She's like, what were you and Stephen doing in the extra bedroom downstairs? I said, well, nothing. <laughs> Look, a bear. No, <laughs> nothing, Mom. And uh, she's like, well, that's not what, that's not what your father saw. And uh, I was like, oh, and she's like, I, she's like, I just don't want things to be hard for you and have trouble for you. So please remember, don't say anything at all to anybody. I said, okay. Um, the very next day, uh, continuing along with our makeup, my Stephen and I, and uh, we decided to um, head back we were out for the day, decided to head back during the day before anybody had got home, and we decided to have some fun, and we did so in the basement. Um, so we were downstairs in the basement, and they had just built this brand new bar um, downstairs where they were going to enter entertain, and the sauna was off to the side, and it was really nice and beautiful and pretty. Uh, and then there was like this small little general area, uh, which was right near the wine cellar. 
um, this closeted wine cellar. And so we decided to have some fun. We were making out, and one thing led to another, and we were having some fun. And then all of a sudden, I, we hear footsteps from upstairs. We're like, oh my gosh, what is happening? Who, who, who is this? And this person is running from room to room to room to room, like they're looking for somebody. And I'm like, okay, I don't, I don't know, I, uh, we gotta go. So I, I grabbed Stephen and then we head right into the wine cellar. And so there we are in the wine cellar with the, with the door closed behind us and we're waiting to see who it is. But what we forgot was our clothes. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are, both of us naked, in the wine cellar, and the, the door is ajar, and he's looking, and I'm saying, who is it? Who is it? Who is it? He's like, it's your brother. I'm like, what? It's my brother. He's like, yeah. He's like, I guess he was looking to see if anybody was home. Anyway, so, and next thing Stephen says is, he's getting closer to the door, Gary. Gary, he's coming. He's coming to the door. He's coming. And next thing you know, woo, the wine door cellar opens and Stephen and I are standing there and we're all naked and I'm coming out of the closet for my brother, literally, and saying, hey, I'm gay and uh, this is my boyfriend, Stephen, so is he. <laughs> and he was quite shocked. Uh, he's like, wow, he's like, I didn't know any of this was happening. What's going on? And you know. Um, had a discussion with him and um, he was like super cool with it. He was two years younger than myself um, and just an amazing fellow um, who welcomed both of us um, as who we were, literally, you know, uh, being naked in the buff. <laughs> that was one coming out that I will never ever forget. Uh, going to, um, from there, um, you know, being 17 and getting into my, uh, the end of my teenage years, um, I, you know, left school and Stephen and I were still together. We were together for about five years and um, I, I got to, went, went to work for um, American Express at the time, um, was, who was a really good, inclusive em employer. Um, I wanted to make sure that I was with, I was with, uh, somewhere that I could actually kind of be myself and not really necessarily flaunt who I was, but just be who I was. And uh, American Express was an amazing employer for that. Uh, when I was up there, um, I was working one day and of course I got a job for Steve there too. So I would approve, he would bring me the applications for American Express cards and then I would approve or decline them. So when you applied for that American Express card and you didn't get approved for it, that was me, so sorry. Uh, anyway, so um, one day um, we, I was driving him home and I went back um, to uh, my home and uh, my mom and my stepfather were not doing really well as far as their relationship. Um, so it looks like it was pretty much on the outs and she's like, I'm, I'm moving to Las Vegas. Uh, do you wanna go? I'm like, okay, um, sure, I just turned 21, so let's go to Las Vegas. Uh, being an American citizen, it wasn't hard for me to do that, and then she was Canadian, so I sponsored her. We were able to do that. Uh, prior to us making arrangements and everything going, I talked to Stephen and to see if he was what you know the deal with our relationship was, if he wanted to join. He said yes. However, at the last minute, about a week before we were good to go, he said no. Uh, so we broke things off, and that was a really, really hard um, relationship for me to get through. Uh, I cried a lot. Um, I, I almost attempted suicide uh, because I didn't really see myself with anybody else, but that's because I didn't know that there was necessarily anybody else for me out there. Um, but being in Las Vegas and working out there um, for their banking, I worked for Citibank and Citicorp out in Las Vegas, and um, I got to know, you know, some other fellow family members, and um, made a really good impression, and met some people, had some fun. However, I really missed my friends um, that uh, I had back in Toronto. And it just didn't seem 
there were over 5,000 people that move into Las Vegas, um, you know, each month. And there's the same amount of people that leave. So when I, like, I had met a friend named Jill who was from um, uh, Nebraska. And uh, she was there for three weeks and then left. And then I met RJ, and he was there for six weeks and then left. So the friends and family that I was, you know, from our community that I was meeting were hightailing it in and out. So it was a very transient town. And lo and behold, I didn't realize that I was going to be the next one that was going to be leaving. So after six months of being in Las Vegas, I returned back to Toronto um, and moved in with some of my friends that I went to college with. Um, and none of them were gay. However, they were all allies of mine. Um, they had supported me with pride. They had um, listened and asked me questions. And these are all people that were like the rocker guy, you know, who would listen to Pantera. This was also the stoner guy who would be, you know, on marijuana all the time. And this was also, you know, a lovely lady um, who was like a blonde bombshell. And all of them were very supportive of who I was. And I miss them dearly. And they became really a close family to me. Um, because it's not what I was necessarily getting at home. When I talk about home, and I would think, and I told you about my coming out story, there was something that I didn't tell you as of yet, and that was the fact that one day um, my mom had told me that because of what was going on with the AIDS crisis, that I had to use my own dishes, I had to use my own bathroom, um, I wasn't allowed to use the family family facilities at all. And then one day she told me, I guess maybe about three weeks later, um, she was dropping me off and I told her that I was going somewhere. She's like, oh, you never told me that. And I'm like, why would I bother telling you anything? I'm like, you don't support me. So that's what my friends are for. And I walked out of the car, closed it and left. And I guess that really truly bothered my mother. Um, and um, she asked me one day to go grab her purse for her, to grab her wallet out of her purse. And um, if it's, you know, your mom tells you to go grab something from her purse, you certainly do so, especially if it's her wallet, because perhaps maybe there may be a $10 note with your name on it. And so I did. And when I did that, I noticed that there were AIDS pamphlets in her purse. She was educating herself about what was happening. Um, and it really, really jarred me. Um, and um, I was so thankful that she was willing to figure things out. And slowly she did. Um, she ended up becoming one of my best friends in life. Um, so things really, really turned around for us. Um, to continue along the lines, when I went back, when I was in Toronto and went back, um, I realized that I'm really pretty much a product of my environment. If, if it's who I'm with, um, where I'm at, where I'm working, um, is going to let me be me. And I ran into this, my friend, he was a concierge at this really fancy apartment building in downtown Toronto. And he said, well, Gary, you need to come by because they've got a pool, they've got a rec room. He's like, come on by, drop in around one in the morning. We'll go for a swim. I'm like, okay, awesome. Uh, we did that and um, we met a, a tenant that was living there and, and uh, her name was Kathy and she had a girlfriend named Tula. And um, Kathy uh, was a bit of a sage to me. And she sat me down and said, Gary, you need, she's like, who are you? You know, you need to be true to who you are. Be true to you. And we had lo lots of several and lovely discussions about who I was and about where I was and, and what I was doing. And I wasn't really doing much in Toronto at my age, you know? And uh, enough so that I picked up my bags and I followed, um, when we talked about one of those diverse friends, one of them was a deadhead. And I decided to go ahead and follow the Grateful Dead for two years. I did follow the Grateful Dead for two years. I met some wonderful individuals, uh, saw some really amazing things. Um, and um, I, was, I was, went back to Vegas for the Grateful Dead show. and. I was um, in the middle of the Grateful Dead show and I stood up and I pretty much realized I need to move to Vancouver. 
And the reason being is that, well, I, this, I know, you wonder why, right? <laughs> yeah, um, well, there were some barbiturates that kind of went with some of that too as well. Um, but also it was the fact that I was staring at a wonderful mountainous landscape that was in front of me um, and how the sun was going down and it was bright orange and red, it was lovely. Um, but how I was so hot because it was over 100 degrees in the stadium and how I really wanted water and how I should understand that who I am is that I'm from Los Angeles, California, which is an oceanside town. Where is the gosh darn ocean? And I'm like, okay, um, I need to maybe move to California. And I thought, no, no, California, no. It's a lovely state. However, this country is still run by Bush. And if you remember things that happened when uh, George Bush was in town and Cheney and all of that, um, there wasn't really much rights going on for gay people. And for me, and traveling with the Grateful Dead, I kind of realized how much I had to mute who I was in comparison to being in Canada. And besides, my friends were Canadians, I loved them, and they loved me, and they would believe anything that I told them. So it was fantastic. Um, <laughs> so I decided to move back to, I went back home to Toronto, because I still had my room there. And they're like, Gary, what are you doing here? And I'm like, I live here. They're like, well, we thought you left. I'm like, okay, well, no, I'm back, but I'm, I'm only back for three weeks because I'm moving to Vancouver. And then that was when my other roommate said, really, when are you moving? I said, again, I'm moving in three weeks. And she said, I'm moving in two weeks. And the next thing I know, like my uncle Bob stops by, uh, who is my mom's brother. And he says, I'm just to let you know, I'm moving to Vancouver in two weeks. I'm like, really? I'm like, I'm moving in three weeks. Awesome, I'll see everybody there. It seemed like the right thing to do. It was a beautiful, I knew what there, I've never been here before. I knew that there were mountains, there were oceans. It was, you know, I know some of my friends that were out here planting trees for goodness sake. I'm like, how wrong could this place be? I don't think so. I moved out here um, and the first place I put my foot down was in Langley. <laughs> Good old Langley. Um, and that was an interesting town to be gay in. Um, and I was there for about two weeks or so, two or three weeks living with my, um, my uncle and um, his girlfriend. And then they, he, she decided to kick me out um, because I didn't have a job and I wasn't able to support, um, to, to provide rent or anything like that. So my uncle drove me to a campsite because at a campsite I'd be able to go ahead and actually have an address, an address that I could take to the social assistance office, be able to go ahead and get some funding for um, an apartment and be able to put myself back on my feet. Uh, jobs weren't coming easy for me, I mean, being able to try and find one, it was a really tough time. Um, from the campsite, um, the social assistance office said, well, no, you can't stay there. It's not really a home, Gary. You can't really stay at a campsite. I'm like, well, it's nice. It's okay. Like, I'm, I'm a little cold at night. And they're like, no, it's not. And they put me into a shelter in Surrey. And I spent the next three nights um, clenching a, a hairbrush um, while I fell asleep and holding on to all of my things so that nobody would be able to ransack me, beat me, um, or do whatever they wanted. Um, it was a really scary, scary time. And I had picked up the phone and I wanted to check in with my friend, Lisa, um, who moved out here. And uh, she said, Gary, you can't do that. You can't live like that. You need to come and stay here with me. And I'm like, but that's your dad's house. She's like, I don't give a shit, I'm sorry. I don't give a darn about what my dad um, says, but you're coming here. So then I moved to Delta for the next three, for the next three weeks. Uh, when my social assistance check finally came in, and her and I went and moved to Burnaby New West, where we were able to get an apartment for ourselves. And um, she got a job, I got a job at the 7-Eleven, and we were doing fairly well. Until we started meeting some other unsavory characters that were also in the area. And next thing I know is that I'm looking out of our balcony window and there's like a camera crew. And next thing I hear is that it's to serve and protect the television show with all the policemen and how they follow people about, <laughs> about where they live and what's happening. I was like, oh my gosh, great. I hope my mother doesn't see this. It's hard enough that I'm trying to make sure my relationship with her is good, let alone have her realize that I'm on Cops, you know, the, the Canadian show. And um, <clears throat> from that moment on, we 
decided we needed to move. And um, however, my friend Lisa, who I lived with, had met a really nice man and did, moved in with him. And um, I moved in with some other individuals that um, I met uh, who became quite friends. They were from uh, Newfoundland and um, they were really warm and welcoming. If anybody's ever met a Newfie, they, you're part of the family. Um, so that happened for me and I bless, I bless them all the time for um, them taking me under uh, their wing. Because um, it was from there that I got to flourish uh, further about who I was and what I wanted to do. And um, I returned to banking. And um, in banking, I ended up um, meeting some other individuals as well. Um, and I realized that the bank that I was working for was really inclusive. They were diverse and they were welcoming and it was okay to be gay. It was okay to be a lesbian and it was okay to be bisexual and it was okay to hold hands at our summer parties it was okay to kiss my boyfriend at our winter parties during the christmas season it was fantastic it was freeing and to be able to be at a place where you usually spend the bulk of your time other than home to actually be yourself at work and not worry about losing your job and not worrying about having um, benefits or any of that it was really awesome um, from there, uh, I got to meet um, others uh, who were really welcoming me into um, training and development and human resources. And they're like, Gary, you're really good with people. You should, you should maybe get into HR. I'm like, what's HR? <laughs> and so they kind of showed me the way and, um, and I became a corporate trainer uh, for um, a bank that had over, you know, 350 employees um, that had over, you know, this was throughout the Washington state as well as through uh, the province of British Columbia. It had over 18 trainers and had over five training centers that I was looking for, looking after, and I was a success uh, for me, for who I was, and it was okay, and it was welcoming, and it was friendly, and um, it was amazing. and in contrast with my friends in America when they were losing their jobs and not being able to you know have their benefits and they're like free medical and like well not necessarily free we had you know we had our care cards and we had we had to pay a little bit and you know and I was complaining that I had to pay $30 for crutches at the hospital meanwhile they're worried about paying $350 for aspirin um, so it was it was really it was really amazing um, from that moment on, um, I continued along the banking line and banking route, and um, I ended up, um, you know, dating, of course, and I discovered that, you know, there's online dating, and um, I was down in, um, I was transferred to a branch downtown um, outside of the gay uh, village uh, on Davie, and I worked at the corner of Burrard and Davie, and I got to know a lot of people from the community. One of those people was, uh, his name was Scott, and he ran the Fountainhead Pub, which was really a meeting spot for a lot of our community. Um, after work, I would go in there and he would welcome me in and we would talk business and, and um, he would give me a free drink here and there or a free appetizer and I'm like, you just wanted me to come back. He's like, yeah, you're right, I do. And, um, and I did. And through then I started meeting some other individuals and some other people and a boyfriend here and there and, and uh, got to meet some really fascinating people. Um, one of those people that I actually met was the unstoppable Connie Smudge. Um, that was, I met them, I met, I, I, yeah, I met them um, one night. We had a couple of pictures. Um, we didn't really talk very much or anything, but I was like, oh my gosh, I got to meet Connie Smudge. And this was big for me because during Pride, Connie Smudge would run the, the corner of um, Denman and um, Robson, right? and um, was the best corner that I loved. It was, it was fantastic. Still is. Yeah, oh, yeah, <laughs> sorry, yes, sorry. still is. And um, anyway, so um, I was then um, excited and I was like, I'm becoming somebody in the community. I'm part of something. Um, not only am I great, you know, having a great time at work and I'm being accepted there, but I'm being accepted by others in my community. 
Um, I realized that there's a bear community out there, people you know, that are like larger men, and that it's okay not to be skinny and thin, and that it's okay to be accepting of my own body. Um, that was another mountain that I had to climb, you know, um, seeing the gay, gay stereotype of uh, thin and beautiful. Um, and so getting over that, um, and it was just, I was living me. And I never ever thought that I would be able to do any of that. And it was with the help of the community and my friends and me educating them and taking the time out of my own time to answer their questions um, so that they could learn as well. And it was amazing. I, was, I went to bed happy. I got up in the morning, I was happy. It was fantastic. And then one day, my boss said to me, Gary, we're transferring you to North Vancouver. You live in North Vancouver, right? I'm like, yeah. He's like, okay, well, great. We've got a branch out in North Vancouver. We want you to go out there and help run. All right, sure, I'll go. I went, and it was horrible. Um, my boss that I worked with um, was very accepting as far as my, um, as my sexuality and me being gay because they had uh, a lesbian daughter of their own. However, they weren't impressed with the fact that I was actually good at customer service or that I listened to people or that I had really good HR talents um, and it was really really a horrible toxic work environment however one day that toxic environment became really pretty and became fun and became exciting and that's because the unstoppable Connie Smudge decided to walk in one day and all of a sudden I now became their banker and it was fantastic. <laughs> and it was through conversations that um, Chris and I had um, about coming in and um, talking about youth and about how not much of our youth know where our history is from and how they think pride is just a huge celebration that's brought on by corporate identity and how it's important that we should be discussing this, especially as being, well, not older, but, you know, um, I'm not of the younger generation, but yet to, you know, be kind of responsible and to kind of show the way of where we were from and why we have the rights that we do. And I'm like, yeah, we should probably do something about that. And then one day we did. And we got together and we talked. And um, we came up with a, a mission and vision statement for it. And, um, and that was in 2018. And right now, so we've started the North Shore Pride Alliance. And um, we are creating safe spaces. And Don't I'm, I, I know, <laughs> okay. But I would like to take a moment right now and to say thank you for your time and listening to my story. And now I want you to bring on the other half of the North Shore Pride Alliance and listen to how he got to where he is as well. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Chris Bolton. Oh, please. Oh, yeah. Now for something completely different. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Chris Bolton. It's actually Christopher Michael Bolton, so no jokes. I used to have the same hairline, but it's gone way worse. Um, Gary's totally right. We did um, meet uh, several times, but that glorious day was spectacular. But let's have like a little r r r retro jam and go back to me for a second and just tell you a quick synopsis of my um, my life, just really quickly. So picture it, the year was 1969, and I was born. And um, the world was in turmoil, sort of like what it is right now. I guess every generation has their battles, right? Um, but it was, you know, race equality and um, Vietnam, and scary things were happening. But great things were happening, too, like the first walk on the moon, and of course, Woodstock. And I believe that's the year that Pierre, Pierre Elliott Trudeau said that, they did, that um, the government doesn't belong in our bedrooms, which is very spectacular. And um, growing up, I always gravitated towards feminine energy. And I was, and I still remain, a total mama's boy. And I love my mom. Hi, mom. And um, I liked dressing up. And I liked dolls. And I enjoyed square ball and skip rope. And my best friends were Leanne Turner and Rebecca Turley. And um, all the people in my circle sort of accepted me for who I was. I didn't even know my name was Chris until I was probably in grade seven. Everyone called me Chrissy. So I was effeminate um, and the only times that I probably had the worst time was um, 
when it seemed like, and it's still the same thing, is that when people are um, jealous of what you have, so I think authenticity is uh, almost like a commodity. So when I'm being, right now, I'm being as authentic as I can be, like, I am myself. And I think that's the most, uh, the bravest thing anyone can do. And I'm, you know, proud of myself for it. But it's also, uh, I believe that courage is contagious. So the more that people are themselves, um, despite any traumas, and I had, I love you, and I am so glad you shared all that because I know so much more about you. Um, I've heard about the, the deadhead business and stuff, but I didn't know it was for two years. And I didn't know about it. I knew there was like a little pup tent involved, but I didn't know you there for so long. So anyway, um, I really had a very... Um, Blessed, and I guess the kids would say that I am, what's that word? Mm, entitled, not entitled, what is it? Privileged. And I am very privileged, but I don't take that, I don't take all of my, um, uh, the privileges I have for granted at all. Um, all the people that knew me were fine with it, and it was all the people um, that were almost jealous of my authenticity. They wanted to shut it down. They wanted to dim my light, because I think sometimes they were sort of hiding behind a whole bushel of straightness, too, and they were just so upset that I was allowed to sort of dance around and play with dresses and things like that. And it is a reoccurring theme in my life. Um, people that want what you have or, or, or experiencing and that don't have it themselves will attempt to make that spirit dim diminish or they'll try and dim your light, which I don't care for at all. But the good news is that that light is yours forever. It can't be given to you, but the best part is it can't be taken away. You have to find that light within inside you. It's already in, within inside of you. I remember being told as a boy that, a little boy, that boys don't cry and they don't stand with their hand on their hip. And it all came very naturally to me. Well, I cry and I feel deeply. That's who I am. And at like 53 years old, I'm still exactly the same way. Um, and that's who I am. And some would say that that is a weakness. But I believe on the contrary, that it's my strength. My feelings of empathy and compassion come from that place. From that place of not belonging and not... Um, uh, not being right, not being correct. And those feelings of empathy and compassion are the reason that I'm here today. They are my superpower. I can still remember that feeling, and so many things threaded in your story. I can still remember that feeling of being at school, and then all the kids start talking, and it's like, Troy's going to beat you up after school. And, you know, you waited, you, you know, dust, uh, cleaned the whole, all the chalkboards, and you, um, anything to, to get out of it. But when you got out of school, everyone was waiting there for a big fight. And I wasn't a fighter. I really was. I had one fight in my entire life. It was in grade six with Laura Alonzi, and I lost. So... <laughs> Sorry, Laura. Um, um, but I hate that feeling, and I just that feeling of not belonging and not being correct or not being right the way you are, it still it resonates with me. Um, I was followed home daily by a boy named Troy. He would all, always taunt and hit. He'd follow and bully me and trip me. He'd try to get other people to do the same thing, sort of join in, and a lot of them wouldn't, but some did, and that even hurt my feelings even more, because Troy was already pooey, but just to get those other people with those same emotions tore my heart apart. And again, courageous is courage, courage is contagious. I want everyone to be the best, the first-rate version of themselves, not a second-rate version of somebody else. Judy Garland said that. And it's really, that resonates with me too, because I have worn very many masks in my life. I was a sales rep for Imperial Oil for 15 years, just over here in Lake City. Um, and I'm kind of, I'm jumping around a bit, but that's the way I am. Um, that was an authentic job for me because I was allowed to be who I was. And having that authenticity, walking into Macmillan Bloedel or International Forest Products selling bulk lubricants, I know there's a joke there, stop. Um, was tough for me. I'd sit in my work truck and I'd be going, oh my God, all these straight guys are going to just go, oh, the gay boy from Nessel's here. And I walked in and it wasn't, oh, the gay boy from, no, it was like, the gay boy from Nessel's here. And I like owned that gay boy. I really did it. Nobody sold more lube in the West End, West Side of West, Western Hemisphere of Canada than Chris Bolton. Let me tell you, it worked out really well. I've got stories too, but I'm leaving those till later. Um... 
I want you to think about how many skills I gained from that bullying. I got to, I now can talk my way out of anything. I can read people at a glance, what they're coming with me, and I can put that mask on, I can figure out, like, do you want to, hi, how are you? Or do you want to, hey girl, how are you? I can do it all. My humor, my sense of humor got me out of tons of fights. Um, walking on that tightrope, it's, yeah. High school, I was again given the chance to go into German exchange. So we had the German kid here for a year, and I went there for grade 11. Um, the upsetting thing was that we were allowed to choose, because there were three German kids per one Canadian kid. So the Canadian kids got to have three to choose from. And I saw this like, kid, blonde hair, very attractive, 16 years old, playing guitar, with his mother baking. I thought, oh, well, that's great. He gets off the airplane in grade 10, and he's wearing an ACDC shirt. Cigarettes rolled up in his... We were not the tightest of friends. But I helped him sort of find his tribe, if you will, at high school. And we sort of were strangers of the night. He skipped more classes than attended. And the same thing happened when I went there. So it was a really good lesson for me, because I literally went to Germany and I could say like, my Name ist Chris. Mm -hmm. And I left and I was dreaming in German. And that experience, uh, I wasn't out of the closet by any means, but I still was a feminine Chris Bolton. And I found that tribe, which Gary was talking about finding that group of people, that family, those friends, the friends of the family you choose. So finding those people, because I was being authentic there, I had nothing to lose. I had the, all the artsy people coming up to me and friends. So I had friends that Marcus didn't even have. So it was, uh, that was a life altering thing for me. That was a sort of a light bulb moment, a road marker, as Dr. Phil would say. It was very important. And I'd say I reinvented myself. And I, but it's not reinvented myself, I became more myself. Then I graduated and I struggled for a while. I'd never experienced with, I'd never experimented with other guys, but I knew that there was just something the iggly piggly thinking in my head. And I continued to date girls into my early 20s. And then a friend and I had a moment in time, I'm not going as spicy as you were, but I'm just, uh, um, and that moment in time where you like have that glance and that butterfly feeling in your stomach that you've just got to have it. You just don't know what it is. And you're so nervous. You kind of feel sick, but you're never had it with a girl. And I love vaginas. I've popped out of one. They're, I, they're spectacular. Um, but the anticipation, that anticipation I'd never felt. And I was always, again, um, I knew what I had to do. I had to start, I, like, back then there was no Facebook or Grinder or anything like that. So the only place to go was the gay bars. And that was sort of, there were pubs and there were bars and I, cer I certainly found my way around all of those. And there was a place called the Royal Hotel downtown on Granville Street and I lived in North Van. And, um, I used to get on the little C bus and go there after work on Friday nights. And you didn't have to call anyone because everyone there was of the same like-minded, and you, you just ran into people. You didn't have to say, I'll meet you there at five o'clock. You just walked in, and that community, that the embrace that I felt from that community, even though I didn't live in the West End, that embrace was the first time exactly what Gary was saying, that you really felt like you landed, that you were on, on your feet, that you were in an environment where you had nothing to lose, nothing to risk, no one was gonna hurt you. You were protected. Um, my coming out story is very different from Gary's. I was about 21, and I was semi-engaged to this girl named Tracy, love her, and um, uh, I went on a date with a guy. And my sister was home, my mom was working, and my sister was home, and she goes, what are you doing? Tracy's like working. <laughs> And I'm going, I'm just going to go meet a friend. She goes, that's a guy, isn't it? And I'm like, yes. I said, but don't say anything to mom, because I don't know anything about this. I'm just feeling something. And so I, just, I went out. And I met him, and it was just spectacular. It wasn't really any love connection, but it was a good friendship. And my mom sat on that information for a month, because my sister told her that night. So a month went by, and I'd broken things off with Tracy, and uh, I knew that, that it, I just had never felt more myself. So uh, about a month later, I was you know, cooking some omelets. I remember it very well, and uh, mixing them all up with the bowl, getting them all frothy. And Mom's like, so, do you want to talk about anything? <laughs> and I was like, mm, uh, I don't know. And she goes, mm, who's Andrew? And I was like, oh, oh. I said, that bitch. <laughs> 
So I said, Mom, she goes, no, you don't have to answer any questions. I'm not going to pepper you with questions. She said, I just want you to know I think this is a phase. Same thing. And I'm going, Mom, dating a guy isn't like, you know, wearing a, a thin tie. It's not like a sort of style. It's like, anyway, so we dealt with that. It was totally fine. Fast forward to 30 years. I, my dad was like the boxing champion for Britain for 53 and 54. He knew nail polish. He knew who I was, but we never talked about it. I met him once a week for a beer. He was a really good guy. Fabulous. But when I was 30, I thought, this is ridiculous. I've been out for like nine years. I haven't hidden anything. My grandparents and my dad obviously knows, but I have to tell him. So he and his wife met me for sushi, and they're sitting across the table, and I put my hands on the table, and I said, Dad, Dale, I have something to tell you. I'm gay. And my dad put his hand on top of my hand and he said, son, I knew you were gay before you knew you were gay. <laughs> Which is always pretty well the story, right? The upsetting thing and the thing that Gary touched on was that, and the reason that we are getting involved with this is because I think knowledge is power as well. So um, letting the younger generations know, not of all the, 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 of course, all the turmoil, but I don't want a lot of this. I don't want to, like, we live through it. But I want people to understand that, like, I was 21 just coming out, and the AIDS crisis was crazy. I went to 39 funerals in two years. Everybody was falling like flies. And it was like you, the same thing you were talking about Vegas, that's what said to me is that, that, you know, they were there for six weeks or whatever. So I was just coming out. So I'd meet someone and they were really great. And then six months later, they were dead. It was the most tragic, horrible. But again, out of that crisis, this strong community built. And they all support, like a lot of these people back in the 80s and 90s, they were written off by their parents. So they had no support. That community came out. We had, you know, before Meals on Wheels or anything like that, we had all of that taken care of for everybody that we knew. So we had all of that happening. And that taught me a lot about what we do today. The West End is where I've, I've, I've formed the fa the, my family, the friends of the family we choose. Um, that's when everything started happening for me, when my confidence in who my true self was. At that point, it didn't matter what everyone else was saying about me. It was, I was the one who had to close my eyes at night and be proud and happy with what I had done with myself and with the world that day. I want you to check in with yourself at bedtime and see if your intentions are lined up with what you want happening during the day, during your life, if you're creating what you need. The positive benefits of becoming your authentic self. You'll be so much happier. Your feeling of fulfillment, fulfillment. Decision making becomes so much easier. It's a weird thing to say, but it does. You don't have to entangle yourself with everyone else's preconceived notions of who you are and where you're going and what you're going to do. Your awareness increases. Truthful, you're so much more truthful to yourself, but you're truthful to others. And therefore, that, that authenticity is completely magnified. Doing, a, doing things on your own terms. I don't have to answer to anybody. Doing what you really want to do. Like, what do you really want to do? What excites you when you wake up in the morning? Do what you love. It satisfies your needs. It gives you a sense of purpose. It helps you prior prioritize how you live your life, being in alignment with your goals and dreams and hopes. Optimism is a muscle that gets stronger with use. It's like courage. It also helps um, with the law of attraction. I don't know if I know everyone thinks it's a bit of a bit of, but I really believe that if you manifest things and you are aligned with everything, I call it. I play the saxophone, and then when we're, we're doing jazz, and you're in that just before the beat, it's called you're in the pocket. You're just, and things are rolling right along. Like you were saying again, that you were thinking about going to Vancouver, and then so-and-so, the best friend said, I'm going to Vancouver in two weeks, and the uncle said, I'm going in next week, and da-da-da-da. That is when all stars are aligning, and it's like, hey, I'm, I'm moving to Vancouver. That's the deal. Now, these are a couple of just things I just want to share with you because they've been really good life lessons for me. And some of them I've borrowed from other people. And I think this was uh, Dr. Wayne Dyer. He, I have a problem with ego. Like, I'm a performer. I'm a big fat drag queen. I have two shows a week. And people hire me for fabulous things. And I fly away to places. And it's a great lifestyle. But my ego, because everyone tells me how like spectacular and pretty and all talented and all this stuff, you have to check in with yourself. Because sometimes ego, and when I say the word God, I don't really 
mean, it can be any God. I, I'm very spiritual, so I believe the, my word for God is universe. So I, it's bigger than I know. I don't know what it's all about, but what works for me, that's what works for me. So, but I say ego is the same thing I've been working on. It sometimes can be destructive and self, self, self-sabotaging because what ego stands for, E-G-O, it stands for edging God out. So, like, sometimes you have to just, like, release and let all the cards fall where they may. You can't plan it too much because if you start planning it too much, the universe or God is going to start saying, well, no, I actually already have this in in plan and actually I'm going to make you go left instead of going right. So don't try to control the situation too much. It's none of your business what other people think of you. None of your business. I don't lie. I don't cheat. I don't steal. Someone has a problem with me wearing a dress? Honey, I, there's worse problems out there. When you think about it, the true self is grounded. It's so real. It is so, so sure of itself. It can't be offended or dissed or disrespected. Because if you're so in yourself, that's your opinion. Nothing to do with me. And when you look at the bigger picture, before you react, take a beat, take a moment, ask yourself, what buttons are they pushing and what experience are they bringing into the situation? So some people come in with their, you know, uh, they had a bad experience at a restaurant. Terrible analogy, but I'm just going to give it to you. And I say, I'm going to that restaurant. Well, they filter my experience by them telling me what their experience was. So not only don't I order the salmon because she had a terrible salmon, but don't sit in the blonde, wait, blonde waitresses section because she's terrible. That whole thing. And that goes back to manifesting too. Because if you put all that into the preconceived notions of what's going to happen and what's going to happen, either all that pooiness is going to happen or something spectacular if you just relax and let it flow. Um, we are innately much better at inflicting pain rather than acknowledging pain. That's it sit with you for a second. I'm not going to, you can take that. Um, How many of you, are you lucky? Gary and I have been talking about tribes or family or friends that we've, are you, how many people have found their tribe? How many people have their family? You all very happy and everyone's loving you? Good, yeah. I think that's why we started everything that we started. I have a deep desire, Elika. The biggest passion I have in my life, my life force, is creating space for people to belong so they can be themselves. It means a lot to me to um, share this journey with Gary, for sure, Um, because we see people, we get letters daily we see people at all of our events. I just did an event on Sunday. There were, I handed out 1,700 pieces of candy to uh, 600 children. Um, and seeing them, I was dressed up in my full regalia. And I was looking a bit girly, but that voice still comes out. And so this little boy looked at me, and I was like, oh, there you go. Congratulations. <laughs> and he was like, <laughs> It's just looking up at me. And then the other thing is there are other kids there who, you know, finding your tribe, they looked up at me and it was like, I was like the last unicorn. They were just, but there were some kids that were like, yeah, thanks for the candy. See you later. But then there were other kids there that I was finding that they were so grabbed. They were like, when can I see you? And I'm like, oh, check me out online. You'll love me. I have read books to children, believe it or not. Um, Thank you very much. And this is a really good thing. And this is where Gary, Gary, one of our, we have lots of models and motivational speeches, or sayings and things. But we believe we, you, you build bridges by crossing them. So everyone can stay, I call it the queer quadrant or the gay ghetto, Denman, Davey, Berard, Robson. I know most, I'd say 80% of my friends work and live in this little environment. Like some of my friends, I live just over the Lionsgate Bridge. Some of my friends think they need a visa. Because they, but they're, they're kept in their, in their in, and they like it that way. I'm not judging them. I'm not doing anything. But there's a big, big world out there. Like I just got on the sky train. It was spectacular. But we, we, believe in, we believe in building bridges by crossing them. So we'll get our fat bums out of the seats and go and visit people wherever they are. And the reason for that is because it is hard to hate up close. So when you tell people like Gary and I are talking right now and you've got to know us a little little bit, 
even if you didn't like us at the beginning or you didn't, you know, oh, drag queen, no wonder she wears, she wears a wig. She's so bald or, you know, all those things are going through my head. I don't worry about all that. And the most authentic, authentic, authentic I can be is because I want to be here to make sure you understand who I am because then when you get to know who I am, you can't hate me. And if you do, too bad. It sucks to be you. Um, not really. I want you to like me. I believe that the, your, your true self, your soul, is what you looked like before you were born. So this is like sort of a meat package we're all in, and we're doing the best with our meat package. <laughs> but all of this underneath, inside of me, and the way I move my fingers, and the way I draw, and the way I sing and dance, it was already in me before I was born, and that's what I looked like, not this. Um, all of my best lessons, everything, I, everything that I've learned, most of the things, have come from really pooey things, like from regret and humiliation and failure and rejection and betrayal. But you know what happens is that when you work on all of those feelings and you have a terrible experience and it made you leave, left you feeling like that, if you make that change, you will never have to feel like that again. And it's that, it's pretty well that easy. And I know we have all of our same safety nets and crutches that we use. But if we can make a physical decision every day to do something just a bit better, by the end of the year, you've done 365 days of much better, much better, much better. Get your shout back. Shout is the, uh, is the internal fire, I believe. And some people, they're stuck in their ways and they're going to the same job and driving their car, and, blah, 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 and you lose your shout. I, the reason I bring this up, my mom had cancer in May, and thank God she's cancer free, spectacular. Um, St. Paul's was great. Um, but at one point in the hospital, she's supposed to be there for four days, and on the sixth day, she started, started falling down, and not, not falling down literally, but just her energy was down, and she was like, the doctor's like, oh, we might have to keep you in here. I, I went into the bathroom, I got out her eyebrow pencil, I painted on her eyebrows, I spritzed her cheeks up, I sat her up, I spruced her up, I said, Mom, you've lost your shout, got to get it back, we've got to get you out of here, because you're not going to get any better. Oh, okay, okay. And she like had to puff herself up, but then once she had it, it's kind of like fake it till you make it, right? You have to, there's some authors that say, um, you have to put your bum, they say ass, but put your bum where your mind wants to be. So those are those um, writers who sit down at their table every day at 9 o'clock and they have tea at 10.15 and they, even if they don't write, they're sitting there, they're doing exactly where they're doing everything they can do and the, the feelings and the, and the thoughts and the words will come through once they're there. But sometimes you just have to sit your bum where you're supposed to be and everything else will take care of itself. Um, and just so you know, we can fail forward. We don't have to fail backwards, but when we're falling back, I want everyone to remember that that back, this, when you're falling back, it's actually someone pulling you back to pull you that arrow and then perpetuate you, pull, propel you into something more spectacular, right? So when you're feeling like you're falling back, guess what? It's just someone in the universe going, okay, and a bing, and there it goes. Um, you have choices. You can be the fool, the victim, or the king slash queen. So those are the three roles. The three roles in life I think we play: the fool, the victim, or the victor, if you will. And let's be victors. Um, it takes courage not to get discouraged. And when you're really facing something new and scary, talking amongst you did a great job today. You were scared about this today. You were fantastic. But just remember, nothing new has ever happened before. Nothing new. You'll, you'll, hit, you'll hit you later, I promise. Nothing new has ever happened before. So if you're feeling trepidatious or you don't want to do it, it's not your fault. It's never happened before. So just go with it. Persistence beats resistance. Nothing right starts without a fight. I'm going to fast forward and give you my last. The more authentic I am, the more I show the world my talents, the better I can love and trust others. And the more I trust others, the more supported I feel, thus letting me go out and do more. And I encourage you all to do more.
So we're going to talk about North Shore Pride now. Yeah. And how we met and how, well, we did that. We did that, how we yeah. met. But um, we started I, off really small. Yeah. Oh, for sure. I remember after we had the discussion about um, what our mission and vision was that we're going to create safe spaces and Good have a power state, of people belonging state. and stuff like that. I'll get the mission state. And you, you took me aside and you said, Gary, you know what? Um, people are really going to like us or they're really going to hate us. And I said to you, mm. you know what? That's, that's nothing new. Like, that's nothing that we haven't been through before. But it's scary. But the fact is, is that we're doing it together, mm -hmm. you know? And it is scary. And, and, uh, but having the courage to, to, you know, to make those things happen yep. is, is important. You know? And it was really good with us because I've been working with Vancouver Pride for so long. I feel like I just want to do this because I want to see you. Um, I've been working with Pride for over 30 years and um, was doing all of the, um, as Gary said, I emcee the Pride Parade and I do things with them all throughout the year. But when they started doing, they started doing the, I think they called it Prance on the Pier. Yeah, they brought in a drag show pretty much because the city wanted to start doing something for Pride at the city of North Vancouver. And so they brought over a drag show and that was when they started. And then you and I were like, well, we need to maybe get involved. Get involved and make this a bit bigger. But the reason I bring that up is because in, every, in smaller <laughs> communities, there's always things like fabulous libraries of the Coquitlam Library here, or we, we work, I work a lot with the City of North Vancouver Library, but I have also worked in Duncan and Parksville and smaller towns. And the library is the beacon of light for some kids. Like I remember when I was a kid and didn't feel like I belonged anywhere, I could go and look through the big long <laughs> drawer of all the cards that I could find to like, where do they go yet? And that world existed for me and it was safe and it was clean because I didn't really like to be all dirty and, um, and people were nice to me there. So, the library has totally transformed in the last 40 years because our library in North Van, and I know that like you've got a beautiful library here. Um, there's things that you, there's obviously things that happen like this during the week, but there's also um, you know games you can rent and video games and movies and um, I think there's even a. Um, at, in North Van, there's a whole digital component where you can go and tape yourself with green screens and learn about computers. And so the library is such a, and the reason, sorry, I know you're waiting for the reason I'm bringing this up, <laughs> but that's the reason that we are, we have been as successful as we have. We actually glom on to other people's starts. So when someone's starting something and we can see like a, a, a little genus of something spectacular, we go in and say, how can we make it even better? So the, I love that city of Vancouver, the Vancouver pride came over to North Van, I think it was spectacular, but it really spearheaded us as locals because they were coming down with like go-go boys and woo, woo woo and we were like, oh, you just want like story time and maybe a couple of drag queens doing a Beauty and the Beast routine or something yeah. like nothing Some to local talent nothing well, to no like yeah. like a big rave or anything. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll get there, but it was great because we could jump on board with them and um, inform them of what we're really looking for on the North Shore, right? Yeah. And then they let us run with it, so it's been ours for the last two years exclusively. No. Uh, well, since 2018 is when we started, so 2019, but then the pandemic hit. Yeah, which we, which we pivoted and we were spectacular. Yes. We did yeah. a lot of online things, and that's where I really started doing the storybook readings, and I did crafts, and we did funny videos, and uh, just to keep ourselves relevant to let people know that we're still out there. We still got letters. We still wrote people back. and um, But talking about pride and what we've been doing over in North Van, because it is still a bit small town, you know, North Van, West Van, and Lions Bay. Mm -hmm. Um, involving yourself locally and the library is yeah. a really good place to start but there's other venues and like uh, groups like community and you yeah know, and also the museum in North Vancouver yeah. as well and archives yeah um, I got to meet um, one of the directors for the museum in North Vancouver and I asked them what their LGBTQ um, exhibits look like or do they have anything and they're like what are you talking about and uh, so then we got to the first couple of voices that they got on record um, for the museum in North Vancouver. So just of, talking about our LGBTQ, experience, you know, growing just, up and, and with them. So the local museum, it was fantastic. The businesses and how the businesses in the community really came out and supported us during COVID. Because um, as soon as COVID hit, see a funding, everything left. It was tough. It was really, really tough. And we did like a fundraiser, and everybody came out and said, "Here, here's a hundred dollars. Here's twenty dollars. Here's five dollars." And when we put all that together, we were able to actually put on like an online show. 
and um, it did really well. It was you know, And then also because, you know, working with not just Vancouver Pride, but then we got together with other local prides like Chilliwack Pride, um, the Tri-Cities. Uh, White Rock. Yep. White Rock, right? Um, Delta. All of us got together and formed like what's called the British Columbia Pride Society. And we were all able to, to feed off of each other's ideas and to help each other and where I could pick up the phone and be like, hey, have my you been, YouTube channel is down. What do I do? Or have you been through this? Like, <laughs> There's other things that we can talk about. Like, you know, there are the haters out there and uh, we're loving. I love every crosswalk I can see. But let me just give you some advice. If you're setting up a, a gay crosswalk or a rainbow crosswalk in your town, village, square, even even if you can't afford a camera, put up a sign and say, smile, you're on camera. It'll deter people from doing something terrible. Because yeah. we've had ours, the Lynn Valley, Valley. one, twice, yeah. and Lonsdale. Lonsdale twice. And, you know, I think that that kind of <clears throat> uh, headbutting, that kind of confrontation can bring lessons and learning. So we're working diligently with the police. The police have the um, footage. And I don't want to yell at anybody. I just want to ask them why. And, and bring them in. It's, we were talking about um, sometimes when you're doing uh, your storybook, Dry Queen Storytime here, that you've had haters outside of the, um, what's it called, picketers? Yeah. Um, I had the same thing over in on Vancouver Island, and I tried to include them, and I did. So I went out and I said, have you ever been to a Drag Queen story time before? I was doing crafts, and the kids were loving it, and I just went, just, can you come in without all your signs and stuff, and just come and see what I'm doing, what we're doing, what we've created. But come in with an open mind. I had 30 people come in very, very quietly, watching the kids like play and... They saw how they were interacting with me. They, uh, they saw how I was interacting with them. They knew there was nothing sexual, that it was almost just like a, um, a clown, really, because I really am just a painted, fabulous angel. And um, no, but they could see that energy. And they, we turned so many people's minds that day, and we, we still continue to, because I think that it, it, you have to... Be sitting. I don't, want to, I don't want people to get up from the table and say, that's it, I'm not talking to you. Because the only way you can solve it, you have to be sitting at the table. So I hate the expression, let's get along to get along. But sometimes you have to get along to get along. Which is why we're an alliance, right? That's it's correct. It's important for us to make sure that there's everybody is, you know, has well, is welcome at our table. And everybody wants to use the LGBTQ beautiful colors, right? And they want to do the he, she, and the she, they, and all of that stuff. And I totally endorse that. I think it's spectacular. But it can't be for one day. Pride is 365. So you have to go out when you want to create something spectacular. It doesn't even have to be an LGBTQ issue. Let me give you some advice. If you're starting a small community organization or sort of um, directive, uh, talk to the mayor, talk to the libraries, talk to your local constituents, talk to the churches, talk to the schools, and see what they've got, because there's lots of money around, and everyone wants to check off that, oh, we're very inclusive, and we're very, and you can take full advantage of that, and um, hopefully build some bridges while doing it. Yes, and have some fun. That's right. Meet some amazing people. How are we doing for Create time? Create a community. Oh my gosh, we're so good. We have time for questions and everything. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions for us? We were that informative? Yes, sir. I hate to bring a negative note into this. No, please. Back in the 50s, yes. it was really hard for gay men to survive. Impossible. There was a lot of physical violence. Yeah. The, uh, the sexual community would take advantage of a gay guy, yep. get what he wanted, then beat the crap up. And I had a number of friends that suffered that kind of thing. Right. Is that something that's still going on today? Not so much. Um, I think the younger, I think anyone sort of below 25 and below, I really, it's my experience at least, um, that there's this word out and I, at first I was like, oh no, not another label. But I like this label, fluid. I think people are, this is my personal belief, and you don't have to believe me, but you know the Kinsey scale? Like, I was dating, physically dating women, and I loved them. I really enjoyed it. I wasn't like I wanted to try their makeup on at that time or anything. Um, so I would say I am about 70, 30, more of sort of 90, 10 at these this day, stage of the game. But I have been a lot of different people over the last couple of years, decades. Um, so I really believe that this new generation 
I think people are falling in love with people. They're not falling in love with their bits. That makes sense? I think people are really, boys, girls, men, and young men, and young women, are finding their true selves these days. I don't think they're worried about their parents are younger than us, God. And so they've grown up sort of, you know, with the same outlook on life. They've been brought up with that. And, you know, if you look in nature, everywhere you look in the wild kingdom, there's not like a gay bathroom or like a girl's bathroom and a boy's bathroom. Everyone is just doing what they want to do and doing who they want to do. And uh, no one, as long as it's... um, um, above board and no lying, cheating, or stealing, I say go for it. And I know what you're talking about because a friend of mine, um, Ted North, he passed away several years ago. He was the very first empress of Canada. And he was actually the person that Pierre Elliott Trudeau called and said, we're getting out of your, ba- your bedrooms. Ted North was always Mr. Ted North, and he was a drag queen. And even when he was a drag queen, he was Mr. Ted North because he started doing drag in the 50s. And you couldn't be a drag queen or have any female name. You always had to carry your boy um, ID on you. Um, So he was always called Mr. Ted North. But the other thing is you always had to have three pieces of clothing, male clothing on you at all time. So he always took one sock and made a boob, one sock and made a boob and wore boy underpants. So when he got thrown in the slammer, they didn't really have any reason to keep him because he was still wearing boy clothes. So, yeah, and that was in probably 60, around the same time I was born, 67, 60, 68, yeah. And, um, yeah, we've, we've, I know we've come so far, but I just think we can, we can do so much better, Gary. Oh, yeah. And, and there's uh, many more roads to go. And I can feel all your eyes and your support and your love and your hearts and your generosity by being here today. I want to thank you for your time, honestly, and I want to thank Anne and her fabulous staff yeah. and the beautiful people in this gorgeous facility. And before we end, oh. I just wanted to make a mention how the relationship with my mom and how damaged it was in the beginning and with her discovering or discussing oh. conversion therapy. Um, in 2019, she actually attended my, her very first Pride with me. And um, it was an amazing time. Um, which she is, came a long and, way. Yeah, which is fantastic. And she came a long way. Meant so much to me. And um, it, it was right uh, the one year right before she passed away. Yeah. So it was. Full circle. Amazing. We do have a lovely. Oh, yes, my darling. I can explain what a drag queen is. Um, there are different. The, there are definitely different kinds of drag queens. So I am sort of. They call me an old school drag queen. So I am. You've seen. I think probably you've seen RuPaul. Have you seen RuPaul and the Drag Race? They put on so much makeup. So they take dark foundation and they line themselves and they chisel out their noses and I'm not that girl. I sort of do a little powder puff and um, I look pretty but I'm not that sculpted queen and there's there's drag queens that are um, gender fluid so they call it, sometimes they're called freak queens so they're not really a guy or a girl but they're just wild looking and spectacular. The best, thing I, best way I can explain, do you know what a mosaic is? Do you know what it is? All the little pieces of tile all cut together and they make a beautiful picture. It's sort of like your school or drag, the drag life. Because when I am backstage, all of those different people are bringing all of their, some of them like pink, some of them like black, some of them like wearing flowers. But all of those different people that come together create this big, beautiful picture of drag. So you're the best thing about being a drag queen or a drag king or a drag it or a drag drag freak or whatever people want to call themselves is you can bring your own sense of style and magic to anything you want. So say your favorite co- your favorite color is this beautiful sort of muted raspberry milkshake you're wearing right now. You could wear that color forever if you wanted to as a drag queen. It could be your signature color. But there's other drag queens who wear nothing but like plaid and great wild colors and you can be whoever you want and that's the best thing is you can keep changing yourself too but a drag queen drag is really just emphasizing what you love most about yourself that's what i would say good answer thanks and emphasize yourselves however you want just be who you want to be and i want to thank you very very much thank you very much thank you thank you both this was so wonderful um i really i mean I think part of the enjoyment of all of this is the life stories. 
it's your story and how you came here. But the, and I imagine you had a lot of challenges over the years, but you say with such grace and such humor that I'm sure everyone really enjoyed it. And thank you so much. Like thank we, you for all your thank time. You for thank all you. of you for coming. Thanks. We really appreciate it.